some of the year's most important stories with Ken Ray. This is Mac Voices. Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Coinbase. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash macvoices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Text Expander by Smile, the makers of world-class software. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more and download your free demo. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we're headed toward the end of the year. It's approaching fast. And it means that, you know, a lot of us sometimes like to look back and, and analyze the year. And this is a year that maybe some of us like, would like to forget. But there have been a lot of interesting and important things happen. Um, and so, of course, we're talking for here at Mac Voices, we're talking about the Apple universe kind of things and the related things to that. And so there's nobody I'd rather talk about Apple News and Mac News with than uh, Mr. Ken Ray. Ken, welcome. It's great to have you for this wrap-up. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Chuck. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you taking some time off from taking time off to uh, to, to <laughs> think about some of this stuff. Uh, happy to. It's, uh, it's truly always a pleasure to talk to you. Plus, you know, you're right. It's the end of the year. You can't – well, whatever. Y- you were saying – <laughs> so the format we decided to use is we each tried to pick three top stories, and we found out that one of them sort of overlaps. We just came at it from different angles. Um, so we're going to you know, work down through that list, and I'm going to give Ken his first pick. But I will ask Ken, are these in order you think of importance, or are they just random order? Uh, they're kind of random order. So, well, not random, but they're uh... – that's the best way to put it. So Adam Christensen and I got to speak to the Silicon Valley Mac user group last week, and we put together a list. And honestly, counting up was just out because you end with COVID-19 at that point. And that just didn't seem like a great way to end you know, anything. Uh, pardon the use of that term. And so, uh, so I'm going to start with that. And then it probably ends on like a happier note, probably ends on a more uplifting note because, you know, Nobody wants to say Happy New Year, you know, bad tidings. Um, so I can't help uh, but start with COVID-19 uh, as far as Apple is concerned. Not that it had, honestly, I mean, COVID-19 is so all-encompassing as far as just everything. I don't know how you could talk about Apple and not talk about it. At the same time, there's not one thing you can point to and say that was the good thing or that was the bad thing or that was the troubling thing. Stores opening and closing straight up, right up till Christmas. Um, I actually did my last episode of Mac OS Ken, a uh, regular episode of Mac OS Ken for the year on the 22nd. So I missed on the 23rd, I guess they opened, they closed like eight more stores going right into the holidays. And you know, it's going to be serious if, you know, two days before Christmas, one of the most valuable retail properties in the country is like, right, we can't field enough players. We're, we're shutting down, you know, stores here and there. They didn't shut down the whole thing. And honestly, I had a bet going with myself as to whether or not they would. And what's a drag is none of that is about COVID-19 in 2021. All of that is about COVID-19, you know, upcoming with the prevalence of the Omicron uh, variant and things like that. The thing that I've been thinking about as far as Apple in 2021 and COVID-19 is how well they have executed, how that has started to look troubling for them towards the end of the year, how they've tried to, like, you know, keep a sense of normalcy. I mentioned um, on this week's Mac OS Ken, I got to go to the Tower Theater opening in L.A., ended up getting to have my picture taken with uh, Tim Cook. And there we both were with no masks. And there most everybody in the in the building was with no masks because it opened the same week the governor of California said, we're good. We're vaccinated. Numbers are down. I think that was before Delta even. And so it was just like people turning up feeling weird because we hadn't been anywhere without masks in a year at that point, but also feeling good because it felt like things were going to go back to normal. And so Apple has kept doing you know some of the stuff that it does. Tower Theater store is absolutely beautiful. Uh, a few weeks ago, before Omicron reared its head, I got to go to the uh, I got to the Grove in LA, where there is a new Apple store, and it's gorgeous. 
And what's weird is I've been to the Grove a few times. It's an outdoor mall. I expected nothing from the Apple Store there, and it's stunning. It is as pretty as any Apple Store I've been to, despite the fact that it's in an outdoor mall. Uh, they did some really interesting stuff with um, the architecture there, which is weird to think about because that is coming in the same season when they can't make enough iPads <laughs> because they want to make sure that they have enough iPhones and one had to be sacrificed for the other because of the uncertainties in the uh, supply chain as far as work, because of the uh, chip shortage, which is prompted way back by COVID. Uh, pull any string at this point, and you're going to get a COVID story, it feels to me. And so I don't, I don't know how to address it. I don't know how to talk about it. There is... Apple's desire to have everything go back to normal or as close to normal as it can at Apple Park. And so you had them saying, when was it they were going to go back? We're going to go back in, not June. I think it was August, then October, then November, then February of 2022. And now it's a TBD um, with, with not even a, a target date the last time they said. Um, they want to do it but they don't know when they're going to be able to. At the same time, all of the events that they now do virtually, I know I am, I won't say I'm in a minority, but I don't think it's the majority yet. I hope they go virtual from now on. I hope they go virtual for all of it from now on. And I'm very sorry for the people who always got invited who won't get to have that good time anymore, but that was at most a 1,000 people. And now all of us are getting a much better presentation, I think, and we're all getting it at the same time, which is great. Um, I feel bad for WWDC people. It seems unlikely that there'll be one for 2022, an in-person one anyway, um, just based on, like, is CES still happening? Do you know? As we record this, my understanding is, yes, it's still happening, but we're also seeing yeah. more and more folks drop out. Right. Intel's out. IBM, I believe, is out. Google's out. I can't even remember. I was keeping up for a few days. And then it's like, by the time it happens, it'll be a shorter list to figure out who's going to be there <laughs> than it will be to figure out who left, it seems. Um, and you can see now, Chuck, why we don't end with this. <laughs> There, there, there are good things. I will say really quickly, there are good things that happened when everybody went inside in 2020 and, you know, businesses started handing out money to kit out people's homes. A lot more people are buying iPad. A lot more people are buying Mac. Apple's ability to execute has been very good for Apple for a couple of reasons, obviously not the least of which is when people were deciding, right, I'm going to be sitting here at home staring at a computer. What do I want that computer to look like? Uh, oddly enough, it looks like the one that I'm looking at right now and have been for, what, 15 years, I guess. Not this one, but, you know, different Macs. Um, their ability to execute and the ease of use, the, the, the less need for um, uh, intervention from IT, all of those things have, have uh, served Apple well. I asked a question at the beginning of 2021 that was, I don't think tactful, but it was legit. And we started to hear this from Katie Huberty later into 2021. Did Apple do well in 2020 in spite of COVID-19 or because of it? And I think the answer is both. But there's no way that we talk about the Mac as being as big a story as it is throughout 2020 and 2021 if all of a sudden people aren't having to make real decisions about their computers instead of just buying them like, you know, like some commodity. I'll get a cheap one because I have a good one at work, or they gave me whatever crappy computer that they had at work. Um, Apple has benefited, which sounds awful and ghoulish to say, but I think it's also true. And that benefit has rolled in 2021. So that's my COVID spiel. I'm glad you brought that the, the last part up because that's sort of where I was going. I think it's interesting that Nobody's asking that question this year. You know, did Apple do better, be, do well? At least I haven't heard it um, because of COVID in 2021. 2020, there was a big, I mean, first of all, there was there were questions over what, what Apple was doing. Should Apple be releasing products in the middle of a pandemic? Oh, my God. You know, is that is that a good idea or a bad idea? 
it turns out it was a pretty good Remember idea that? because we we've been here a lot longer than any of us at that point anticipated being. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't remember hearing anybody say should Apple be releasing products. I think there was question, I mean this is part of the reason that we have uh, the shortages in chips that we have, right? A lot of people cut orders initially because they thought everybody was going to hoard their money, not do any buying, you know, wait and ride it out and see what would happen. And it turns out when people weren't going on vacation as much, when people weren't, you know, going out to eat as much, when when they had they always had disposable income, it seems, or you know, people who always had disposable income had always had disposable income. They weren't disposing of it quite as much, and so they wanted to buy things with chips, either to freshen up the home that they had been living in, because now that's also where they're doing their recreation and their vacation and everything, or just because they had a little more jingle in their jeans. Who knows which? But either way, all of a sudden, we're trying to buy twice as much stuff with chips when the people who are using chips had you know cut their orders because they were afraid that nobody was going to be there to buy it, and we're still recovering from that. Um, yeah, the fact that they've been able to do it. The thing that's most, the thing that's most interesting to me is that they did come into the holiday quarter saying we're not going to have enough iPads, and I thought that was weird when they said it on the earnings call, and then some analyst, I can't remember which one. Or maybe it was uh, Nikkei. It, it was maybe a business publication that said, right, the reason they're not going to have enough iPads is because they're taking those components and putting it into other stuff that people are going to be buying more, uh, mostly the iPhone, I think, um, which was uh, which was a, a f- fascinating. And it also, it it's a tiny bit worrisome because Apple has been able to execute across the board uh, up until, you know, this holiday season. When they said, right, we're going to sacrifice a thing. Now, they sacrificed the thing they could afford to sacrifice because, you know, a lot of people are buying iPads either as part of the uh, work from home thing or uh, as a back to school thing. Uh, both of those things are already baked in, let's say. So if you're going to sacrifice anything, I guess that would be the thing to do. It's still, you know, a tiny bit trouble. Like, it's like the first time you see your dad nervous, you know? Like dad's always been like the biggest thing ever. And all of a sudden dad, dad's looking a little shaky and it's like, Oh, that, that, that makes it a bit more serious. Not that COVID hasn't been serious, but when Apple says, right, we gotta, we gotta tone something down. Um, I'll be curious to see how that goes in 2022. I, yeah, I agree with you. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I, I think that everything that we're going through right now is probably about, a year later or more than we expected to. I, I remember when we mm-hmm. left the office, you know, we, we got together, you know, kind of made sure everybody had what we thought they would need for the next two weeks. And yeah, we'll see you in two weeks. And that's, you know, yeah. now we're pushing, you know, we're, we're headed toward a year and three quarters where, you know, it, yeah. we might've been back for a week or two. And then, you know, one of the variants popped up and now we got to change it again. So I, I, yeah. I get that Apple can't, Apple nor anyone else is going to be completely insulated from this forever. Just not going to happen. Um, but they yeah. seem to be working their way through it. That's kind of a nice problem to have that if, if I can't sell you both devices, okay, I, I will pick the one that is, has the most demand and dedicate my chips to that because I know I'm going to make the sale. So, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, they're they're in the catbird seat. When I talked about, I mean, I hate to use terms like that because what we're talking about ultimately is, you know, intensive care units that are overrun. We're talking about, you know, people literally getting sick. I have a friend who was careful, as careful could be, and luckily he was uh, two vaccinations and a booster, but I'm spending every day, at least twice a day, checking in with him going, you okay? You okay? Because he, you know, blew positive on a test. Um, sorry, I got, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have thought about that because now I'm distracted by that. Yes, you're right. It's, um, it's, there's, there's no part of Apple that you can talk about that isn't affected by it, I think, which is why it was my top story, whether I wanted to be or not. But your reaction there to that, Ken, I mean, and not to take advantage of your reaction, but, you know, I think that's what happens. I think maybe not every day, maybe not every 10 minutes, but, you know, all of us have been distracted by someone we know, someone we care about, you know, at, at one level or another, 
experiencing COVID. And, you know, that holds true for everyone at Apple as well. So, and, and Apple as a business and Apple as just a, a group of people. So, you know, it, how almost how could it not be probably the top story because it's affected Apple and, and everything associated with Apple and everything associated with pretty much everything else. Yeah. Today's edition of Mac Voices is supported by Coinbase. For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash macvoices. Is one of your New Year's resolutions the task of leveling out your portfolio of investments? Are you considering crypto as part of that process? If so, then you need to know about Coinbase. Coinbase offers portfolio management and protection, learning resources, and a mobile app so you can trade securely and monitor your crypto all in one place. They offer a safe, intuitive place for crypto traders, buyers, and sellers of all experience levels. I'm just getting into crypto, and that's why I'm excited about the resources and services that Coinbase offers. Why not join me in the crypto journey? For a limited time, new users can get $10 in free Bitcoin when you sign up today at coinbase.com slash macvoices. Sign up at coinbase.com slash macvoices for $10 in free Bitcoin. This offer is for a limited time only, so be sure to sign up today. That's coinbase.com slash macvoices. Thanks to Coinbase for their support of Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Smile, the makers of Text Expander, my most used productivity utility. It's hard for me to imagine me not using Text Expander, and therefore it's almost as hard for me to imagine you not using Text Expander. Text Expander lets me type a snippet of text and have it turn into a word that I frequently misspell, a sentence that I repeatedly type, or a paragraph that I often need to use. Or it might turn into a block of code for publishing Mac Voices. Or just about anything else that I need to use repeatedly and that I need to have entered correctly. The convenience is the cake, but the accuracy is the icing on the cake. Without the accuracy factor, convenience isn't very convenient since I would be wasting time going back and correcting and recorrecting what I entered. Everyone I've ever introduced Text Expander to has loved it, and I know you will too. But there is some lingering doubt, right? There always is. Let's get you over that by having you visit textexpander.com slash podcast and sign up for a 30-day free trial. No credit card required. You will have your first snippet created in minutes, if not less, and be on your way to a Text Expander enhanced future. TextExpander.com for a 30-day free trial. Do it now and tell them that I sent you. TextExpander is made by Smile, the creators of world-class software. Thanks to Smile for their support of Mac Voices. Do you have a fun one? Well, I think so, maybe, and it's sort of it, it's sort of a chip one, um, and that is the, the the new M1 MacBook Pros and the new M1 chips mm. or version. Um, mm-hmm. I felt like this was a really big deal because I mean the M1 chip, you know, in the uh, in the air was great and and phenomenal, and the performance was amazing, and everybody was like, okay, you know, this is great, but you know, what about us pros? What about the people that really need serious, serious horsepower? I mean, the M the M1 gave serious, serious horsepower, but people wanted more. And expected, you know, if there's if there's a quantum leap at this level, there's got to be another quantum leap over here. And I, yeah. I for one, and he had, I, I for one had trepidations about can Apple really do that? And then when the M1 Pro, uh, M1 Pro, and the M1 Max came out, it's like holy cow! You know, this is mm-hmm. really what a lot of us have been doing. I'm going to be doing a briefing on you know my experiences with my new MacBook Pro first part of the year. But I know now I can do things with the videos for the, for Mac Voices that I could not have done before realistically and kept up a production schedule. But now, I, I mean, it's, it's the power has been slowly building and building. So, I mean, it used to be I would set a video to render and go to bed and wait for it to be done overnight and hope that nothing blew right. up, you know, in the render. Um, now I can barely go and get a cup of soup before the render's done, which is not a bad problem to have, but it just shows you what has happened. And, you know, it also has given me some options to do some other things. And I'm, I know that there are other people out there that are still saying, well, we want the, the iMac with the, with 
these M1 chips, and we want the the Mac Pro, whatever shape it's going to take, literally, with those chips. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fine, I, I get that. But I just feel like this was the year that the the whole M1 series strategy strategy uh, and delivery was validated. Well, first of all, the people who want that stuff, I mean, it's going to be in the next 12 months, right? Maybe less, because Apple did say that they were going to take it two years uh, to make the move. They started in November of 2020. We're in December of 2021 now, so you got 11 more months for them to, to pull it off if they're going to. The one thing, again, that you might worry about is um, yeah, chip shortages and things like that. I have a question, though. You said you had a bit of trepidation. Was your concern that Apple would not be able to do it like architecturally, or was your concern that the apps and the support wouldn't be there? Um, a combination of both of those, just that the, 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 the pro version of these things would not deliver the expected power based on what the we now consider consumer level M1. Um, the, mm. the, the difference that that made, you know, it's like, okay, can they really do that again at the pro level? And everything in my experience so far and everything I've read, nobody's disputing that they have done that and more. Um, you know, maybe not quite beyond, beyond our wildest expectations, but pretty much out there. Cool. I wish I wish I could speak to it um, uh, from personal experience, and I just can't because I'm not going to hang out at Apple stores for obvious reasons. And I had thought that you know by this time this year I would pick up an M1 something, and then I had a moment. I want to say in October or November of just absolutely loving my computer, and it's a it's a late 2018 Intel uh, MacBook Pro. I can't tell you anything about the specs because I'm not a specs guy. And there's part of me that says, oh, you know, I should get one so I can know. But I'm just still so in love with my Mac that I haven't made that move yet. So I I wish I could speak to exactly what you're talking about. I will say the one thing that's kind of cool about it is I'm not buying a first generation. So by the time I get it, it'll be better than the one I would have bought this year. Um, And I'm very much looking forward to having that kind of power. Although I could honestly make do with a Mac, I could make do with an Intel-based MacBook Air if the if the hard drive was big enough. So I'm I'm not in a I'm not in a huge hurry. I'm very much looking forward to getting there uh, when it's time for me to go. And listen, I, I I agree with everything you said. You know, I mean, make do, yeah, absolutely. And for a lot of folks who don't do what I do, or maybe what you do, mm-hmm. that all that power may be kind of wasted on them they're still they still want it just because they want it but you know they yeah. really don't need it but for the folks that need it or the folks that maybe have been putting off projects or not doing things that they maybe they just couldn't afford the time involved or whatever now uh, mm-hmm. now i think that game has changed and so if you have the need for that power or the you think you do or if you just need a new machine now you're going to have that power at your command what are you going to do with it? So that, right. that would I would be, imagine it's going to be hard. Sorry. I would imagine it's going to be harder for some people. No, it's okay. I would imagine it's going to be harder for some people to decide between the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro um, when the time comes around, only because the M1 is so much uh, better than anything they would have had before. But, wah. <laughs> I'll probably end up with a MacBook Pro. Even though I could do it with a MacBook Air, I'll probably end up with a MacBook Pro because... I'm a pro, Chuck. You know, it's like it's one of those things. I bought this computer uh, with the anticipation that I might do video, and I did a tiny bit of video for about a year. And it was not a limitation of the hardware; it's I get bored of doing video and don't feel good doing video. So I don't need another MacBook Pro, but I'll bet I get one because you know I know me. Well, now maybe you can contract it out to me since I have the fast MacBook Pro and I can do the video editing for you. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, we'll talk uh, We'll talk after if I ever do video again. That was the job application there, folks. Mm. <laughs> so how about uh, the, your next pick? Because I think if depending on which one you go with, this may be our crossover. Uh, were you going to do imaginary products? 
Yeah, if that's, that's my next pick. pick. Yeah, and and that's my from, pick. Okay. From our pre-show discussion, I think we're on the same wavelength. We just are talking about it differently. Okay. Uh, the two things that I found most interesting, because um, in getting ready for year-end stuff, I went back to um, I went back through. I want to say the first nine months, because I'm assuming I can remember the last three fairly well. I went back through the first nine months of scripts for Mac OS Ken. And what what I had forgotten about was how early we were talking and how fervently we were talking about uh, Apple Car or something to do with Apple Car. Now it's easy to forget, you know, how much we talked about it at different points in the year because this has been a story since 2015. I want to say Project Titan first entered my consciousness in 2015. And, you know, uh, talk of it comes and goes. And sometimes it's they hired this guy from Tesla. That means they're six months away, too. They lost this guy who used to work at Tesla, which means there's a brain drain. And there's no point in Apple doing this. Um, it's back and forth, back and forth. Start of the year, it was Apple is going to partner with Nissan, Kia, Hyundai. I can't remember who. There was a, uh, there was a, a, a closed... Uh, car factory down in Georgia that Apple was going to start producing cars out of. They were hoping to get 100000 off the line a year uh, for the first couple of years, ramping it up to 500000 or a million or something. It was all this stuff that we heard, and it was just it was just so fast and furious. And then it, like in March, I think, it just the whole story fell apart. And and so then it goes back to the usual, oh, they hired a guy. You know what that means? Oh, they lost a guy. You know what that means, you know, for for the car. At the same time, at the very beginning of last year, we heard from uh, uh, TF International Analyst Ming-Chi Kuo that Apple was going to come out with some sort of augmented reality something, uh, headset, visor, whatever, uh, sometime in 2021. Now, he's had to revise that a couple of times. I think he said second quarter of 2022 uh, earlier this year, and now he's moved to the fourth quarter of 2022. Does that get pushed back into 2023? I certainly hope not, because I want this thing as much as I wanted an iPhone before there was an iPhone. But taking my personal part out of it, this to me is one of the biggest stories of the year because of something that happened just about a month ago, I want to say. Uh, Morgan Stanley analyst Katie Huberty came out with a note saying, we need to start thinking about the things that Apple hasn't told us yet. Rather than, um, you know, talking about iPhone sales last quarter or whether the next iPhone is going to be the next big thing, uh, let us think about all the things that, you know, Apple is going to get into that we know they're going to get into even though they haven't. Um, so she says we know they're going to get into cars. She says we know they're going to get into augmented reality or virtual reality or some sort of mixed reality thing. She's not the only one saying that. Then she held up a couple of things as examples. Like um, in 2014, she said Apple didn't have a wearables business. Today, Apple's wearables business is the size of a Fortune 120 company. Uh, five years ago, there were questions of whether Apple would be able to make a real dent uh, as far as their services go. They've doubled their services business in the past, what is it? Doubled their services business in the past four years, I think it is. Uh, services now account for $70 billion in annual revenue. Um, yeah, doubling over the last four years. What's fascinating to me is, you know, she's saying that's what we need to think about now. Not just how Apple is performing today, but how they're going to revolutionize the areas that they're going to go into uh, she's um, showing a, a tremendous amount of faith in Apple there. But, you know, look at the Apple Watch, look at AirPods, look at, you know, the stuff in wearables that, oh, golly, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, whatever. Back when I was still doing the first version of Mac OS Ken Live, I talked about how excited I was for Apple to get into wearables. And more than one person calling into that show said, oh, I don't understand it. And I believe what I said at the time is, well, I don't understand it either. But it's but it only makes sense. I mean, if we're walking around with stuff, I think I argued at the time that the iPhone was practically a wearable because it was always in your purse or back pocket or front pocket or someplace. I didn't know what you know Apple getting into wearables would look like, but I was very excited about the possibility. Same goes with augmented reality and virtual reality. I mean, virtual reality is kind of easy to understand just because we've had examples of it uh, with, with Oculus Quest, with the stuff that HTC has. 
I'm sorry, with metas, whatever they're calling that stupid thing now. Um, sorry, I shouldn't call it stupid. I apologize. Um, the Oculus Rift, actually, not the Oculus Quest. I, I've only had a Rift. I can't remember, and I don't even have it anymore. I had it for a few months. But we've had clear ideas of what virtual reality is and could do, and we've had real-world examples going back to the 90s. I mean, part of... Um, um, work with genetics or work with uh, DNA um, had to do with virtual reality, like, you know, uh, being able to take these models and piece them together. And I remember reading about that in a book in 93. So we've had lots of ideas of how VR could go. Nobody really has a clear idea of how AR could go, but Tim Cook says he thinks it's going to be, you know, that one day we're going to wonder how we lived without augmented reality the same way we wonder how we lived without smartphones. So I, you know, is it going to go well? Are we going to like it? Are we going to look back and wish it had never happened? All of that is possible. Uh, but I think it's, uh, I think it's really exciting. And I think it's really exciting that, you know, business and money are like, right, well, that's going to be a thing, so we need to go ahead and start accounting for it. So that's my imaginary uh, product. I'm doing lots of spiels today, Chuck. That's my imaginary product spiel. Well, it's okay. That's okay. Um, because right. my, my second pick was the metaverse, um, and not necessarily hmm. Facebook's version of it, but the all right. the conversation, all the talk about around it, and... If you want mm -hmm. an example of what the metaverse, you know, the, the whole metaverse concept, you go back and read Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash. Because um, mm -hmm. I've, I've had discussions with people and almost arguments that, you know, well, Neil was the first. No, Gibson was the first. And, you know, then there were some other people that did things that were sort of in that realm. But at least for me, the, the, the metaverse became a solidified concept with, with Snow Crash. So that said... Mm -hmm. I've been intrigued by just what you said there at the end, the money that's, that seems to be focused and the interest uh, that has gone into this, because this was already kind of tried once with Second Life, and, you know, to some degree, and mm -hmm. I know that there were, I know people that were really into Second Life, and I know there were businesses that were trying to, you know, conduct business in Second Life and did to, you know, maybe a limited degree. Admittedly, I draw upon the the comparison of the Newton versus the iPhone and iPad. You know, the Newton was mm -hmm. very clearly a very cool device, was way ahead of its time because the, the technology just had not caught up with the concept. So was Second Life ahead of its time? And, you know, the technology really wasn't there. And now do we have the technology to do this? And you know, how about the human factor? I mean, are we going to want to spend our day working in... In, in virtual reality. We're struggling enough, you know, working under COVID restrictions from wherever, wherever it is you happen to be working from. So I, I've, mm -hmm. I'm really intrigued by just just the, the interest and the, the optimism, if you will, or maybe a better way to say it, is the lack of skepticism um, that, you know, that, that seems to be expressed here, at least in the things that I've read, because I don't see... I haven't seen openly skeptical things. I have seen some pieces that say, you know, kind of we'll see. But by the way, we're investing, you know, X number of hundreds of thousands or millions or even sometimes, you know, something with a B in there uh, into being part yeah. of this. And I, I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. I should have, but there was somebody talking about a land grab in the metaverse, which, mm -hmm. you know, what does that even mean at this point? So I, I think... The fact that, that we are engaging in these conversations, and this kind of goes back to my M1 chip thing, we have now things that are a whole lot more powerful than we've ever had before. You know, will this make a difference? And then, to your point, you know, how is it going to be responded to by humans? What's it look like, and how are we going to use it? Right. Yeah. It's, see, the thing is, what's interesting, I don't, my questions about how is it going to be responded to and how are we going to use it has to do more with augmented reality than virtual reality. Um, it's interesting that you brought up uh, Second Life. So when I was working with Roddenberry, we were working with a virtual reality outfit called Sansar. And Sansar was at the time, it's not anymore, but it was at the time a subsidiary of Linden Labs. 
and Lyndon were the people behind Second Life. And so I got to talk to a few people who were aware of both sides of the business. And Second Life was still a going concern. It wasn't a growing concern, but the people who moved in, for all intents and purposes, in 2005 were still there. And they were still generating revenue in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't want to quote numbers, partly because I don't know if I would be allowed to, and also because it was a couple of years ago now, and I can't remember what they were exactly. But, you know, 2005, 2006, you couldn't open Wired without reading something about Second Life or, you know, any number of other tech sites. So I don't think anything has to set the world on fire to be successful. Um, That said, the thing that I worry about with the metaverse is will there be a metaverse or will there be Facebook's metaverse? And Roblox, a lot of people think of Roblox as a metaverse because while you think of it as a game that kids play, it's actually a place where people go and build their own games until it came up in the Apple versus Epic court fight, in which case they had to quickly start calling them building experiences instead of building games. But, you know, people go in, they build their own games, and they do their own stuff, and they hang out, and they chat, and they, you know, they play. And I guess in some people's way of thinking, that is sort of a metaverse. Uh, uh, Fortnite had a concert that had three, uh, three I want to say it was three million. It might have only been a million, only a million. But they had a concert where they had something like a million people watching it. And we think that Fortnite is a game, and Fortnite is a game, but Fortnite is a game that also had a concert and that also has other people turning up and doing stuff. Is that the metaverse? Is that a metaverse? And can I walk between the two? One of the things that a friend of mine was most frustrated by with the thing that Sansar did was the fact that you basically had to load every experience differently. So if you're at the you know museum about the moon and then you want to go to the game room that somebody built, you kind of had to call up a menu, you had to push a thing, and then it would wait and it would load and it would go. What my friend wanted was something more like what Second Life had had and what I think we all think of as the Snow Crash metaverse idea of just being able to wander outside of one experience and sort of stumble into another or go from one place to another or hop in a virtual car and drive down the virtual highway and get to the virtual thing as opposed to very much a we're loading up an experience. What are they all going to look like? And am I going to have to pay 20 bucks a month to get into each one? Or will it be a thing that's sort of supported by Microsoft and Facebook and Amazon and Google and Apple, or will one of them sort of splinter off and do their own thing? What are they going to be? That's That to me is fascinating. Um, I will play in every single one of them, at least for a bit, just because I've been waiting for this since 90. I'm sorry, 90, since 1990. 1990 is when I first heard virtual reality talked about and thought, Ooh, in, in five months or six months or five years even, that's going to be great. And here we are 30-something years later. And I'm like, oh, it's going to be great. Get off my lawn. <laughs> Ken will be back in the next edition of Mac Voices to continue our conversation about the metaverse and pick two more of the top stories of 2021, or at least the ones we think are important. That's next time on Mac Voices. Until then, and as always, I'm Chuck Joyner. Thanks for watching.